All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Trading with Crypto. Now, before we get into the actual webinar, as usual, please take a moment to read the risk disclaimer. That's long enough. Right, so uh, what are we going to be discussing today? Um, well, first of all, I'll introduce myself a little bit so everybody knows who I am, what I do. Um, then we'll talk about basically crypto in general, a little bit the history, where it came from, what it is. Uh, we'll look at different cryptocurrencies and particularly the ones that Legacy FX pr promotes. There's obviously a bunch of cryptocurrencies nowadays, but we'll look at the ones that, um, I'll, I'll skim it a little bit, but we'll, we'll look at the ones that Legacy FX offers, which would make the most sense. Um, then after that, we're going to look at uh, buying crypto versus trading the CFD. So basically what it would be the difference between you straight up buying, for instance, Bitcoin or trading Bitcoin through a CFD. And at the end, for those in the webinar, we're going to have the Q&A session. For those that are on YouTube, that part won't be there for you. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> so about me, um, well, my name is Mike Rotink. Uh, I'm 36. I live in Athens in Greece. Uh, wife, kid, dog, you know, the whole nine yards. I'm originally from the Netherlands, um, where I studied international business studies through a Cambridge program um, that was through Delphium College. And this was basically the period where I started rolling into financial things, including trading. And eventually I, I settled on Forex, what we now know as Forex. And like most of you at the start, um, especially, you know, at the age you want to, you know, get rich um you know look at all these youtube videos that were starting to pop up trading wasn't as popular back then as it is now so there was limited amount of content and there was a lot of you know under the radar kind of stuff happening so as most of you you know way too eager not really knowing what i'm doing even though you think you do um you know blew up an account or two and then um the third account i basically started the idea of Let's start at scratch. Let's really take it step by step, learn one thing at a time and slowly build up my knowledge base on how to actually trade these things, sticking to majors, sticking to two or three currency pairs, learning them inside out, and I'm building out from there. Um, well, that worked for me. And um, I ended up with that account you know, growing, being able to fund other accounts and eventually fast forward 15 years later, um, rotated out of the, the daily Forex trade in, in, as the only investing, let's say, or as the primary investment, I should say, and allowed me to go into offshore investments, uh, structured notes, um, you know, lump sum investments into bigger things. And um, that brings me to what do I do? Uh, with that all said, you know, I, I realized that maybe it, it would help others trying to pass on my knowledge to avoid some of the beginner mistakes that I ran into um, through uh, mentoring. Apart from that, um, now for five years, yeah, five years now, I've been doing these webinars for various brokers that want to uh, do this. In this case, obviously, Legacy FX, um, you know, providing these webinars with me having the intent of trying to pass on some of my knowledge, hoping for you guys to, you know, avoid some of the pitfalls and, and some pointers and hopefully get you to the profitable side of trading faster. Uh, on top of all the trading, I'm also currently busy as uh, financial services, um, working on my CISI. Um, and yeah, that's more towards like, you know, structured investments and offshore and you know, insurances and general financial services. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell, not so much to go around there. <clears throat> So let's take a look, creep very, very brief crypto history here. So the original creator or creators, we're not sure, is Satoshi Nakamoto. And this was in 2008 on a white paper. Um, nobody knows who it is or what group it is. Uh, it was a white paper in outlining basically what we now know as crypto, as blockchain. And Bitcoin was a side effect of that, but we'll get back to that in a minute. The problem here is that we have no idea who this person or group is. 
um, and until they reveal themselves, the the currency rates will be stable in, in that sense. But regardless of what happens, if this person would ever come forward or a group, considering the huge amount of Bitcoin of the total market value they have, um, it would have a severe impact on the pricing of Bitcoin in general because they all follow Bitcoin's pattern, generally speaking. And we'll see that in the chart later. You can basically mirror them. They're, they're all correlated. <clears throat> and that means that, you know, this is important to understand that this person, we don't know who it is. But if they ever come forward, that will have an impact on the market. So what exactly is a cryptocurrency? Well, it's a digital coin and a coin in bits and therefore Bitcoin started that way. Um, it is a reward you gain at a mining. We'll go into that a little bit more detail later, how mining exactly works um, on, on a basic level. I'm not going to go very detailed, obviously. But in, in essence, a cryptocurrency is a digitalized version of a currency. And that has is a completely new way of seeing currency. Obviously, we're used to right, credit card transactions and we're doing online transfer, but they're all based on existing physical currency. And this is a completely online currency. There is no physical Bitcoin, right? You can't go to a store and, and get one Bitcoin. Right? This is only digital. Therefore, there are some issues with that. But one of the things is that decentralization means there is no controlling body, yet everybody can see everything up to a degree. So what decentralization really means is that there is no one centered controlling body, like a bank or a validation service, that knows exactly everything about the transaction and in the way that it works in blockchain and why it's decentralized is that it uses a peer-to-peer -peer system. Now, for the techies, they'll know what that means. But basically, every computer can be considered a node and consider it as a station right, or a, a way station. And the cryptocurrency can go through any of these routes or all of them. Now, this also gives, there, there's something called uh, a blockchain explorer. <clears throat> We're not going to get into that, but you can see every single transaction and see who the sender is, who the receiver is, what the transfer is, what is supposed to be in the transfer, but you cannot see the actual data in the transfer, right? So the whole idea is that it has transparency without a single body can able to control the flow of information or the transaction. For instance, if I transfer from one bank to another, one of the two banks can hold the transaction, let's say over the weekend, and gain interest over the weekend over that transaction. So I may get it on a Friday, for instance, and they'll just hold it till Monday. So you're expecting your money, but you're not getting it till Monday on your account. Right? The transfer's been done. It's been written off on the one person, but it's not added to the other person's account, right? Well, that's because the bank controls that transaction. They can basically just clear it or stall it or whatever they want. Now, obviously, there's regulations in place to stop from you know exploiting this <clears throat> that came over the years. But with the cryptocurrency's decentralization, this cannot happen. The transaction happens. End of discussion. Nobody can stop it. It's irreversible. which means you cannot do the old fashioned credit card, I pay you and then you claim it back. That doesn't work with crypto. So if you make a false transfer, well, you have to hope the other person that gets it is you know, honest enough to send it back. Otherwise you just lost it, which is one of the danger downsides, obviously. Now, what is blockchain? <clears throat> so we can get extremely technical in this, but I tried to simplify this a little bit. So let's just go through the steps because if we take a look at the right top, this is, for instance, you asking me for a transaction. So this transaction goes into the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is basically a bunch of computers, which I mentioned before, are considered nodes, right? That could be you, your neighbor's computer, whoever is connected up onto the network, 
generally speaking, miners that do these transactions that will then validate the transaction, right? There's a bunch of algorithms and blah, blah, blah. That's too complicated to get into now, but that validation happens basically by the miners. They then involve the whatever is required that they want to transfer. So that wallet, let's say it's a Bitcoin, you're transferring a Bitcoin from your wallet. It gets sent to the node. It gets verified that you have the coin, that the receiver has a, a wallet that it can go into. And that get, gets encrypted after verification and the data is inserted. It gets verified and it creates a new block. This is a singular block, which is a singular transaction. That block then gets pushed into a amount of blocks, which is then called a blockchain. So it's added to a chain of other transactions. This was the main idea to make it less hackable because you don't know what you're looking for. It's not a wire transfer from A to B. It is a wire transfer going from A to C to B to C, B back E, F, G, and then to the moon, to Jupiter, back to Earth. You get the idea. And that is muddled with a whole bunch of other transactions clustered on top of each other. So there's no way to singularly take out that one block. Once it's part of the chain, you cannot undo it. The original idea. Then once all that steps are verified, boom, you get your transfer. So right now I transfer my one Bitcoin from my wallet through all these steps, and it's now in your wallet. <clears throat> Right, everybody's happy. You just made 40 grand. There's a second step to this. So the mining happens in this area. Now, I'm going to not switch to the next slide because we're going to discuss mining. So this, in, in very, very simple terms, is how blockchain works. It is extremely complicated on the processes on the backside, on the algorithms, the coding, Forget about that. For us doing the trading, it's not that important to understand how that works unless you plan on starting mining. But what is important to understand is that this is not just for currency transfer. Blockchain can transfer anything. Anything that's digital, it can transfer in the same encoded environment that only the sender and the receiver can read the encryption. They're the only two people or instances that can read whatever is in this transfer block. Nobody else. Now, like I mentioned before, there's something like a blockchain explorer. Okay, that person can find this block or this blockchain and see what's in it. So it's sending from Mike to Steven and it involves a file. That's it. That's all the information they can get. They can't see what's in the file, right? Because that would be a little bit too much of transparency and a little bit prone to uh, other problems. All right. So, <clears throat> for instance, if it would be money, they would see a transfer of currency, but not what or how much. Now, you can guess what if it's currency because blockchain for Bitcoin uses its blockchain. Ethereum, Litecoin, Ripple, they all use their own system. Ripple doesn't use a blockchain system anymore, but that's beside the point. But Ethereum, Lithium, and a bunch of other ones, Dogecoin, all these kind of fun stuff, they all use a blockchain version of themselves. Right? They create their blockchain. So when I transfer something from Bitcoin or on the Bitcoin uh, chain, it stays in the Bitcoin chain with all the other transfers that are made that involve the Bitcoin blockchain algorithm. Okay, it can't be all of a sudden mixed with, I don't know, Ethereum block, Ethereum's blockchain command, right? They're separate. Right, so if you wanna transfer, let's say a Bitcoin to an Ethereum, let's say you wanna swap them, well, then you obviously first you get the, the whole conversion rate and, you know, what's the value of Ethereum versus Bitcoin. So how would that translate, blah, blah, blah. That would happen basically in this part. 
But basically what happens is there's an extra step. This would first go finish, um, then there's an extra step. There. So that would be, so let's go Mike and Steven again, right? So Mike wants to send one Bitcoin, but Steven wants to receive that equivalent in Ethereum. Basically what would eventually happen, which is not implemented yet, is it would send through all this process. It completes the blockchain chain, but it goes to the blockchain independent server. It could be any node, right? So the run of the receivers will also be one of the nodes. So instead of it going this way, consider it going back here, which then goes to Ethereum, which is that node, and then does this chain again to go into the Ethereum chain, and then you receive it as Ethereum or the equivalent thereof. The problem is because I mentioned that these blockchains are unreadable except for the receiver, Bitcoin is not a receiver. Bitcoin would be the processor, so you can't make the transaction happen that way. So that that's the thing they're trying to. That's the next step, basically inter intertype, but. You now can convert, and it works a little bit different. They they, val they they turn it into dollars, and then buy Ethereum. And anyway, right? So it's not impossible. It's just a bit different now. <clears throat> but eventually, that would be a completely closed system. At least that's the idea. So, where does the mining work? Well, this is basically the mining center, right? Because the next thing we're going to discuss is mining. So, what happens with mining? Okay, so let's take me again, right, Mike? I send a a file, right? Now that file needs to go through these nodes, needs to be verified, then needs to be turned into a block, then added to the blockchain. That number two, three, four step, that is what mining is. Is the validation and processing of the encryption, the validation, encryption, and adding to the blockchain to complete the transaction. That is what mining in essence does. Now for every time they complete a block, there is a chance of getting a, and if it's the Bitcoin one, a chance of getting a Bitcoin or a partial Bitcoin, and it is partial, it's not a Bitcoin, right? You don't get one Bitcoin. You get a thousands of a Bitcoin or something like that. As a reward. So that's your commission, let's say, for applying the validation and making the transaction work, right? This is the problem of it being decentralized, right? There's no established thing that just do, does these things. Like if in Europe, you make uh, a transaction, any transaction, there's a company in France, I'm not gonna name it, but they see all transaction details. So that means they check your bank. If they has the balance, they check the card number that you put in or credit card. They check the pin you put in and see if that is correct with the card that it was. They have all the details. They can see everything, your card number, your pin, your bank account, your amount you have on it, and also for the merchant or person that you're sending it to. And they validate the transaction if everything is green lighted, right? That's how that works. That's centralized, right? They can control it, flag it, stall it. But this validation is done by nobody knows. It's one of the nodes, but nobody knows who that node is. Which also means there's no one line that you could hack. Right? if I would go on the line of whatever merchant, let's say the European Central Bank, uh, not validated for anybody to try but let's say you have the european central bank and they make a transfer to i don't know the german bank you know what that line is going to be it's going to go from point a to point b to point c there's only one line that goes there so if i get myself an entry in any of those two lines in between those entry points i can hijack that transaction which is what happened in the past just ha has happened in the past right and usually it was with siphoning with blockchain, because you don't know where that line heads initially, it could be, it happens over one line or maybe a hundred. It doesn't have to be a singular point. It could be multiple nodes at the same time, each doing part of the validation, creating one block when they come back together into the chain. Remember, the receiver and the, the sender and receiver are the only one that can read the encryption, but the encryption has a unique number, let's say. So even if I do part A and there or part one, 
and there's a hundred parts, the hundred parts will automatically form a block because they're all identical with coding. And they then get pushed into blockchain. So everybody did a hundredth of the total validation. So they have a chance of getting a hundredth of the Bitcoin mine, for instance. And it's a chance. You don't always get it. And this is why it's so power intensive. Okay, so that in a nutshell is a little bit the history or the idea of crypto. Obviously, it's way more complicated than this. But for us to know for trading, it's good to understand this part. So let's look at a little bit about the different uh, cryptocurrencies. And like I mentioned, these are all available on uh, legacy FX to trade as CFD, uh, both versus the euro and versus the dollar. But let's start with the Bitcoin, which is the, let's say, gold of the cryptocurrencies, because that's where everything is priced on or compared to. So like I mentioned, the creator is Satoshi Nakamoto. And we have no idea who or what, what who this is or what group this is. And it started in 2009. The white paper came out in 2008, but that was for blockchain. It wasn't a result of the crisis. Da, da, da. The, the Bitcoin part came out in 2009. It was a side effect of creating blockchain. Now, blockchain has a cap of how many coins can be mined in total ever. 21 million coins. Now, this is important to understand. There is a maximum supply. Eventually, that cap is reached. Now, the processing of a transaction of Bitcoin takes about 10 minutes. That is the transaction per block, the validation speed per block, right? Now, anybody have an idea why I stress so much that it's important that there is a market cap in the amount of coins? Here's the curveball. Who wants to answer that one? And pull you guys back in because I have a, you were sleeping at this point. <laughs> So who can tell me why it's important that a coin has a cap? Or anything has a cap to be real. Like dollars or euros. Correct, Mark. But why is that important that there's a finite supply? Yeah, exactly. Uh, not so much control. Control is implemented other ways. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the amount of currency available. Yes, Rachel, you got it right. It loses its value, right? It's because in the end of the day, now normal standard currencies, dollars, euros, they have a validation of what makes the currency a certain value based on the economy of the country or countries, if you talk about Europe, and thus the strength of the coin compared to everything else right supply of natural resources oil blah 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 eternal economy export import trade balance you name it if in the let's say the dollar example the, the mint decides to turn on the mint indefinitely and just print out dollars all day long with no limit the value of the dollar becomes meaningless because there's an infinite supply and you cannot have a balance of supply and demand if there is no supply cap because it becomes if it loses all value right there will always be available therefore it has no value not really and if it has a value there's a limit to how much value it can gain Right. If the demand increases and increases and increases, but the the cap is infinite, then the value will just level out at some point. However, when the de demand is increasing, but the supply is fixed, then the more you get to the cap, the higher the demand, the higher the price will get jacked up. Right. Same with gold. 
Same with oil. Right? OPEC did this a few years ago when the prices of oil were tanking. They simply shut down half the factories and go like, oh, well, there's no more supply. Look at that. Boom. Price goes back up to 50. Everybody knew they were going to do it. They weren't allowed to do it. They did it anyway. Because that's manipulation. But, you know, who's going to tell them now? Right? But that was literally the trick. You just changed the, the supply. Now, Bitcoin, like I mentioned, is a reward you get or can get from mining. Now, do note that Bitcoin or currency, cryptocurrency in general did get an alert in September 2021, which is why it dropped, uh, which was an investor alert. Because one big thing about all cryptocurrency is that it has no financial authority regulation in any way, shape or form. For those that were there early, there used to be something called binary options. And this is a very negative word, so I'm not going to know the name it again. But BO, for short, <clears throat> was the nesting ground for scammers. Because it was literally gambling, pretending to be trading. Cryptocurrencies had since that invocation in the early 2000s, 2010, 2011, how many companies came up with their own coin, crowdfunded, etc., and just disappeared. Some of you might know BitConnect. I think that's the most known one. But they had like everything in place, right? They had uh, celebrities promoting it and, and the whole nine yards. And they were told the celebrities fell for the same trick, obviously. And yeah, really behind this and, and crypto. And then all oh, one day, poof, company gone. Including all the money that people put in it. It all went to the owner who disappeared. But Right, so not having any regulation is a very big issue. The problem is because it's decentralized, how the hell do you regulate this? Yes, there are some regulations when it comes to the process of the blockchain, validation, stuff like that. But there is not on a financial level like you would have with other trading instruments or stock. Keep that in the back of your mind. So the next one I want to discuss is Litecoin. Uh, Litecoin is one of the spin-offs that was, whoops. Wait, hold on. Where did we go? Did I click? What, what did I click? Hold on. Uh, hello. Why can't I go back? Oh, come on. Wait, is my thing stuck? Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Oh, there we go. I think we're back. Right, okay. I don't know what that... Everything froze up for a second. Sorry about that. Uh, right, so where were we? A uh, Litecoin, right. So Litecoin was made by a programmer called Charlie Lee. We know who it is and what they came from. It's a programmer. And it was launched in 2010. Now, Litecoin has a little bit of a different setup than Bitcoin, but it's a similar setup. Similar. Um, but they do have an interesting story when it comes to, they have a market cap of 84 million coins that can ever be produced and their transaction validation, the whole process takes two and a half minutes per block. So that's already a lot faster. Obviously you take something that's known, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you just make it better. Right, so they took Bitcoin and looked at where is Bitcoin lacking, and then they made it better. That's the idea. But Litecoin was accepted by PayPal in 2020 as an official currency you could trade on or pay with through Bit PayPal. So that obviously helped the price. Now, do keep in mind, this is a good example of how volatile these cryptos still are. In September of 2021, so recently, a month, you know, two months ago, Litecoin was announced to be partnering with Walmart. For those that don't know who Walmart is, Walmart is a um, 
a retail chain in the US, one of the largest. When that news was announced, the price of Litecoin jumped by 30%. Turns out it was a complete hoax. We're completely made up. Fake news. <laughs> it was, somebody just pushed an article out there. It was completely made up. There was nothing with Walmart and Litecoin. And the price obviously dropped, but not even all the way back. So, so even on um, the old saying of stock, right? S buy on the news, sell on the rumor, do both or do neither. We don't know. I don't know who know that one, but right. So it's 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 like everybody's just speculating basically, and something comes out, oh, and there's a knee jerk reaction. Right, so this is important to know. So let's take a look at Ethereum. So Ethereum was one of the um, spin-offs that came earlier. And they only launched the actual stable coin in 2013. The original creator or one of the creators was Vitalik Buterin. He's a Russian-Canadian uh, programmer. As well as uh, Charles something. Now, one important thing to note here is this little sentence. It, this one. There is no market cap set. <laughs> okay, good to know, Rachel. Uh, all right, good. But there is no cap. So here is the problem with Ethereum. If you were, if I would tell you, okay, you can invest in, uh, I don't know, this coconut tree, but the coconut has infinite supply of coconuts and there is two buyers, you'd never invest in it because you would never get your money back because the, the price will never go up because there will never be competition to getting a little bit more than the other because there's an infinite supply. There's an infinite supply. Therefore, there will never be a problem with supply. Transactions hella fast, though. It's the fastest so far. 12 seconds per block. On a blockchain system. Because the last one doesn't use blockchain anymore. Right? But the funny thing about Ethereum is it was crowdfunded. To start, it was crowdfunded. And... And eventually there was a little issue with a, a decentralized autonomous organization, which was called the DOA. Very, very creative. But basically what happened is that company crowdfunded an additional $50 million. And that <laughs> crowdfunding got hacked. And the hacker never paid the money back. But What's important to understand is that Ethereum, out of that, created a new chain, right? So you have an existing blockchain, the classic blockchain from Ethereum, and a new one. They decided to keep both. What happened afterwards is there were several other attacks because apparently Ethereum could get hacked. So obviously, you know, if one can succeed, others will try. So they've had numerous attacks. They all had, but Ethereum is the one that got hit at some point. So let's take a look at the last one on the list, Ripple. Ripple's a bit funny. Um, so it got launched in 2012. It has no market cap. Now, Ripple Labs Incorporated is just a, a, a company set up. You can find out who's behind it. But in 2014, Ripple started to think about, well, let's not be a coin system. Let's be a verification system. They had a messaging system that was based on the Ripple uh, algorithm and coding system. That was very popular. A hundred banks signed up for it to start using the Ripple messaging service that completely backfired afterwards. But what happened is in 2014, the Ripple verification system, so the way that they verify transactions, got up access towards the US banking system. 
even though everybody was screaming, there's a huge amount of security concerns, obviously. And on top of that, there was no regulation. So without any regulation, uh, people weren't very happy with it. Now, last year, I don't know who knows this. Does anybody know what happened with Ripple on December 21st last year? I want to take the silence as a no. <laughs> so on December 21st in 2020, the um, Securities and Exchange Commission, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, filed a lawsuit against Ripple, or at least the two uh, C-suite guys. Because basically what happened is Ripple did something what basically constitutes as insight trading, I guess, but they basically generated out of thin air, right? There was no process or request from my, or they just literally just printed out of thin air, just made a number up and started selling those coins from the company to investors, right? Now they were charged for selling unregistered securities and technically what well, basically, generally speaking, you have an IPO with companies and I think most of you know what an IPO is. With, with cryptocurrency, you have something like an ICO, right? Initial coin offer. Well, if you're just literally making up numbers and just making it whatever you want, it's a never ending ICO. You can just farm it forever. Well, that's basically what happened. So in the end, they, <laughs> they sold 14.6 billion Ripple units for a uh, small fee of 1.3. $38 billion, supposedly for the company, but they, obviously they also use it for their own pocket. So here you understand why, now that you have heard these four, why there's so much pro and con for cryptocurrencies. Because yes, it's really new and it's exciting and there's a lot of volatility. And we're going to get to that in the next thing when we start uh, talking about trading it. But what is important to understand is that it is still in its baby shoes, really. And there is so much going happening behind the scenes of people trying to abuse systems, loopholes. Like, this is important to understand for the next bit. Because what happens when we're talking about trading and buying? So let's look at buying crypto in the first place. Well, first of all, the exchange rates. Right, we already mentioned if it doesn't have a market cap, the exchange rate eventually is going to flatline or become zero. Second of all, the usability is dependent on the adoption. Right, but here's the problem Bitcoin now has a value, it was like 40,000 a few years, a few months ago. Imagine you going out for dinner, just put it in a very practical example. Right? Let's say Bitcoin gets adopted as a normal currency you can use everywhere. And I'm not even going very small, but let's say you go to a, a restaurant with your, you know, with your significant other and you order a nice bottle of wine and you have a nice nine course dinner at a Michelin style restaurant. You got a thousand euro bill. Pretty cheap one star Michelin, but still. You have a thousand euro bill and you want to pay in Bitcoin. How's that going to work? You're going to transact 0 0.0000001 Bitcoin? How many dots behind the zero are you going to go? Behind the comma, how many zeros behind the zero are you going to work with? It's like, oh yeah, I have 0 0.0000342 Bitcoin in my wallet. Like, <clears throat> right, this is just not, a, and this is when the price is now as low as it is. Imagine if it actually goes up to a cap where we think it eventually might go is $250,000 per Bitcoin. Well, good luck paying with it then. Now, unlike stock or normal currency, crypto doesn't have any proven track record yet because it hasn't been adopted. It hasn't been circulated as a payment system yet. Not mainstream payment. Yes, people have paid for things in Bitcoin. I know. Mainstream, 
right? Everyday use. See what the the viability of it is, how the integration is, where the adoption. We don't have that. Ergo, the, the price is that volatile because of it. Right? Liquidation is another issue. It's become more and more easy now to liquidate your Bitcoin into actual currency. However, it's still not. Yeah, for instance, central banks will never allow it. And yes, El Salvador, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But yeah, so right, you have you have this big problem. It's like, okay, let's say you have 10 Bitcoin. Find somebody to liquidate the 10. It's become easier now, but it still gives the problem. Eventually, somebody has to actually turn it over and turn the Bitcoin back into the mining market and take it off the radar and get the money. Otherwise, it just circles forever. And that's a little bit of a problem considering, for instance, Bitcoin has a halving period every three years or so. Every 210,000 blocks that are farmed, the price gets cut in half until it reaches the 21 million coins farmed. The more you know. Um, which obviously with all the above creates the volatility you see now. Like I mentioned, there was one hoax news about Litecoin and Walmart and the price just shot up. Let's say tomorrow somebody yells, oh, Bitcoin is being accepted by Amazon. Like it's only payment system. Eh, then what? Everything is going to have a knee-jerk reaction. Or let's say the Fed accepts it. And it's now going to be part of the U.S. national like payment. Uh, like, what kind of effect is that going to have? And obviously, when you buy crypto directly, it's a one-way street. It's the old-fashioned buy low, sell high. It's like stock, right? If you buy actual stock, you can only buy the actual coin and you're holding it, hoping that the value increases, like investing in real estate, which is quite long-term and you need quite a chunk of gash to do that. Right, more and more every day. Well, less and less every day at the moment. But and I already mentioned, right? It's unregulated, right? There is no financial regulation system for cryptocurrency. So, as you heard in the story, like there's a lot of under the ground nonsense happening. And I didn't even mention things like Dogecoin and Dogecoin. God, what do you have now? Spider Coin and like people are just making it up as they go along at this point. Tomorrow there will be Mike coin. Like, okay, what value does that have? Well, depending on how many investors buy it, that creates the value, but it doesn't really have any value because it means absolutely nothing. This is a major issue. Uh, remember Elon Musk buying Dogecoin? Oh, yeah, maybe it's too high. Oh, okay. Right, so you're tied in with that. So if you're going to buy crypto directly, be very, very careful and mindful of what's going on. Like follow every single bit of news all day long. It's quite intensive and you might still then be slow. So let's compare that to training a CFD. Why is that so safe? Well, basically, you're just going to apply your standard FX strategy if you have one that you would normally use on any other CFD like metals and stuff like that, where the the rules of opening and closing your entry exit strategy apply to commodities or stock, individual stock, I'm not meaning FTSE 500 or something, individual stocks, like you would day trade stock. You can still read out price action because you're just using the candle pattern and price action is applicable in currency. Those patterns are, are showing themselves not as strong yet as, as obviously established things, but there is price action. And obviously the benefit from trading a CFD is you can buy either, you can buy or sell. So you, you know, right? You can trade either way, you can hedge if allowed by the broker. I think like a CFX does, but right. So you can play with it. And because of that, the volatility can be beneficial because we traders want volatility, right? It's our lifeblood. Right. It's a, but it's a knife. It cuts in two edges. But at least if it 
tanks, you can still benefit from it tanking. If you're buying current crypto and it tanks, you're not benefiting in any way, shape, or form. You're just losing a bunch of money while running through the street. Like screaming, stop. Right? Obviously, you don't have any liquidation issues because you're not buying crypto. You're buying a contract for price difference. But you're just using your regular trading account. The downside of that also means that it's obviously a lot less ROI than if you would buy crypto at, let's say, 10 grand and it jumps to 70K. Yeah. The amount of return you can get on a good buy on crypto, if you time it right, is absolutely insane. It's unheard of. But it comes with a lot of downside. So high risk, very high risk, very high reward. Now, if you got 10 grand laying around you don't care about, worth a shot. But otherwise, I'll go back to that later, Rachel. Uh, not, not with crypto, at least. Um, the other thing is trading with a CFD it gets regulated through the broker because you're just trading a CFD. So you're under the MIFID or FCA regulation that the broker has. You're protected in case there's a mistrade or anything like that, like a technicality issue, right? Depending on the policy with the broker, you're covered through that. And then you have a fallback of the SCA or the MIFID, which I think for everybody and most of you are, and if you're not, obviously it doesn't apply. I say most are smaller time traders, right? Under $2,000 accounts, <clears throat> you're not buying crypto. And let's say you had 10 grand. Are you going to put all the 10 grand you have in one coin? Here you can spread, you can play with it. All right, so actually let, let's, let's actually go to the chart for a second because there's a few things I want to cover there. <clears throat> Now let's take a little bit of the history on, on Bitcoin. So we had the first initial rush. You know, this was a long time ago. And then we got to the list, little whole peaky thingy majigan. This drop I predicted perfectly. No, oh, not perfectly. I was one day off. But this entire period up to this point was because you could not sell the currency. The trading commissions would not allow you to take a sell position like the big market makers do, right? To take hedge positions. You could literally not open one. Well, if you can't sell anything, obviously the only place it can go is up. And that rule was uh, applied on the 18th of December or something. I knew it was happening in the first, in the second week of December. I got it off by one day. I think I predicted on the 16th. But anyway, it was the 18th and then it dropped. But this was also the halving period anyway. Right? 15 to 17. Well, 14 to 17 to be real. Now, after that, recovery, right? 2020 happened. Then we got that first initial spike where everybody freaked out. Right? We went to that 60,000 mark. And that's the same time where a whole bunch of other news came out that crashed it straight back down. We since then recovered or retried to cover, right? But it's now pushing back down. Now, if you think about how do I analyze something like this, it's on a weak chart, by the way. First of all, let's take a look at some basic technical data from the last low point over the previous low point we can simply do, do do this, and it's, hey, come here. This is the MT5 platform from Legacy Effects, by the way, for those who are wondering. We can see that here it closed underneath that trend line, if you can call it that. But it was, here we have the two tops, they're also converging. So we had our nice pyramid. So what is really going on here? Well, it closed underneath that, and the next major one is somewhere over here. 
and there's one in between over. Hey, work with me here. So why is this relevant? Well, you can you can apply this is quick and dirty, right? You can you can fine tune this if you go to a day and stuff like that. Why is this why is this important? Well, you need to understand that if we now go to Ripple, we see the same pattern, except they didn't recover as much. Litecoin, same pattern. Ethereum, same pattern. Except Ethereum hasn't broken its trend yet, I think. Uh, might this week, actually. So these are all connected to each other. Right. So basically, if you would be a technical trader and you basically do a naked chart like this, well, if you're going long term, you would basically just say, OK, I'll sell it. You put your stop loss above the previous high and you take profit. You know, it is going to be somewhere over here with your trailing stop activating once it reaches this line, because from that point, it can bounce back and you want to make sure that it doesn't go back to zero. Right. This is really quick and dirty. But there's a lot of fine tuning that you can do here. Okay, so that's one thing, right? This is purely technical. If we then look at, let's apply all the other things. Let's take a look if, for instance, Fibonacci applies to something like Bitcoin. So we take the low to the high. And we extrapolate that. Let's see what the pullback is. Well, it actually adheres to the rule of the 61.8, almost. So yeah, Fibonacci applies to Bitcoin as well, or cryptocurrency in general. So for those that are trading on Fibonacci, yes, you can use Fibonacci for this as well. No, I did that the wrong way around. My bad. Cool. So we extrapolate that a little bit. Boom. So we're at that 50 mark and it stopped at the 61.8. You see how that drop happened, 61.8? On the spot, exactly the ruling for Fibonacci. But we also know that we're now past that trend line system. So the chance of it now just actually breaking it is also fairly high. And we have, for instance, our RSI is going through 50. It's done that before where it flattened out, but now it comes from a lower point. So extrapolating that, it could possibly do this. We now have, see, when it was here, it was already at the bottom. Here, it's only starting now. So there is probably more momentum coming for the sell, which will aggravate more sell, which will make more volume goes down. Look, there has not been a sell volume since here. Uh, there was a little bit here. Right, so we're probably looking at a repetition of this curve. So for those who use indicators, right, you can expect, okay, maybe... Okay, if I'm using indicators to trade with, that's one. And we're touching the 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 fast MA. If you're moving, using triple moving average, right? We see here the fast MA is shot up. It bounced off of it once. It's at that again. If it breaks through, then it will probably go to the slow or to the medium and then the slow. And if they cross, well, then, well, you know, if that happens, then we're in a whole different universe because then we're going to crash, probably. All right, but I would expect around the 10,000 mark, between 10 and 15K, that's where people will get a lot of confidence to buy a bunch of coins because they made a lot of money on the first sale and they'll re-enter again, which is basically this level right here. Like, I think that would be roughly the realistic bottom at this point. So between the 10 and the 15K, so 12, 12 and a half. Something like that. Now let's look at price action, for instance, right? Is price action applicable here? Well, we have a rising star. We have engulfing candles. Uh, we've got doji formations. We've got gravestones, hammers. Obviously a lot of wicks. So if you're a day trader, can you trade this on four hours? Yeah, because all the rules apply. Except it's way more volatile. Right, you have these massive drops all of a sudden when it breaks through. But yeah, the apply the, the same rules apply. Right now we have this this flat line. So if you would be trading on the four hour scheme after the previous drop, this is your cap. 
and you can see it's a converging channel, right? We're moving towards a point. So if this breaks through and it would follow the rule of a channel, then this is roughly what we're looking at. But that is if it stays stable. But obviously, if it drops below this point, then it will most likely accelerate. So you would get something like this, probably. Right, you would be comparing it at previous drops. Let's take a look. Hey, work with me here. So let's just quit. Again, this is really quick and dirty. Don't don't like note down these analysis or anything like that. It's not trading advice. Let me just state that for legal reasons. Right, you would get something like this. That was the previous channel. So if we just copy paste that to the new one. except now we come from a different price level, but it will look something like this. So if we squash that and go back to a day, where are we at? Yeah, could be something like this. So we could say, well, if this is the start of the actual downtrend and it doesn't bounce back, and we now have a confirmed bottom, but if you want to take the wick out, you do this, but that's a pretty big wick. It looks like this. Right, that would be your angle. So every time you're in the top, you sell, bottom, buy. So you can still do your day trading on this like you would do any stock day trading right? through CFD. You, you, you can apply the same rules you do in your stock trades, whether it be Apple, Microsoft, or any of the blue chip ones. You can use it same here, but you have to keep in mind it's, it trades more like, a, like an exotic kind of thing, right? A Brazilian coconut farm stock because of all the factors of it being young and adopted it's very volatile so you have to be careful with breakouts and false breakouts on top of that okay and obviously from fundamental aspect like i mentioned hoax news or false news um and all these kind of points you need to keep an eye on the crypto news you have to literally be on top of that constantly now somebody just pointed out uh, without stop loss yes like always you always 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 trade with a stop loss always like i showed in my example you know what the previous resistance is where it should not go anymore unless it breaks the downtrend that's where your stop loss goes your take profit should preferably be at least a one to three ratio from there if it makes sense the chart will tell you so if you're doing a trading or let's say we do a four hour trade let's let's just make this a very simple example and you have a variable lot size on top of that let's go all in so uh okay let, let let's say you expect this to bounce back first based on this Okay, I'm not saying it's going to, but let's assume you want you're you're positive it's going to buy again. Right? Because it's been jumping, it will probably pull back a little bit. Fair enough? All right. First of all, we can calculate the rough average angle of the up right here it's slow, there it's fast. So if we compare the two, then we just do that line. Right, this was roughly the up that took four bars here it took 11 bars so combine 15 divided by two seven and a half so about seven bars so about here so that would be the average guess of if the next candle is green where we would start seven candles something like that is that right oh dead on right where would your stop loss be well this wick would be the optimal situation but we already know that if my take profit is going to be over there right over here that I can't put a stop loss down here. Like th that ratio does not make any sense. We can factor in these two wicks, however, if we expect it to stay above its current level. Therefore, if I would go sell now, stop loss would be just above that wick, factoring in that's the longest wick we've had so far from that position. If you wanna go a little bit safer, you can take a little bit more. And now you have, and that's if you enter on the line right now. 
So then you would have a take profit of two, hold on, glasses. So 24,000 pips and a stop loss of 15 and a half. Let's make it simple. Now, let's factor in for calculation's sake. Let's say you want to do 0 0.0, 0 .0 keyboard, work with me. If I do a micro lot, what would the value be if I put my stop loss there? Stop loss is, uh, oh yeah, no, that, that's unfair. Wait, hold on. Fine. Now, can you only do a mini lot? Okay, you can already see the big gap that you have. Keep that in mind. So I put my stop loss here. That little bit on a four hour trade, that's a $200 bet. Versus about 200. That's a big gap, by the way. So you need to understand for all of you that are wondering, should I trade this on my $1,000 account? I think you can answer that question for yourself now. Like with gold, like with oil, the smallest lot size is a mini lot, which values at a different size. It's not like your US dollar where, you know, the micro lot is 10 cents, mini lot is a euro. It's not a euro or a dollar, okay? So this is 17,920 pips. Yeah, so it's about 10 cents per pip. Am I saying that right? 17,000, 17,000 times 10 cents is, no, it's one cent per pip on a mini lot. Okay. Now I'm confused. Why am I confusing myself? I don't know. No, oh, yeah, yeah, it's one cent per pip. Oh, I got it right. Right. Some would think you'd check that before, right? Didn't you? Yeah. Right, so it's one cent per pip, right? So the smallest you can do it with a mini lot, with a mini lot is the value of a cent per pip. But because you have such a massive difference, massive distance, it racks up really fast and this is a tight stop loss so crypto is not good if you have a small account for those that really want to start incorporating crypto into their portfolios i suggest setting up a 10 grand account minimal you want to mix majors some minors add some cfts of you know gold and the, the standard portfolio setup and then as final option, take one or two cryptos where you have the equity move, where you have a stable portfolio of trades and add this as an additional. Going all in on crypto is very risky. And personally, I won't recommend it ever. Add it to crypto? Yeah, add your crypto. But as number 10 of your 10 trades in your trading portfolio okay so uh let's get rid of that so let's say you want to trade right really short term kind of trades <clears throat> okay so let's say you're you're a really short term time trader so an hour please don't do this like i guarantee you're going to shoot yourself in the foot with five minute trades in this stuff don't go lower than an hour please Again, personal recommendation, if you want to do five minutes, go for it. Be my guest. I recommend against it. Now, if I would make my stop loss, let's say, again, we're doing the same buy because we're convinced we're buying. Because, yeah, we're, we're waiting for either price action now, maybe this morning star, who knows. But... We got this little gentleman going on. We got the bigger picture going on. But this this gentleman over here shows us this one. 
Okay, so I'll lock that in. So that's the hourly downtrend at the Oh, will you stop removing that line? Let's lock that in. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at this one. No, it's been pretty stable here. Okay. All right, so we have this pattern, we have a double resistance. If we extrapolate this one down, we end up here. There's this wick, there's that wick. They both stake out how much? Well, you measure that. That's two and a half thousand. Come here. Three thousand. So, okay. 2.8. So let's say 2.8. So if I would extrapolate straight down to the resistance where it can go lowest, plus 2.8. So it's right here at 46299. Uh, where was it? Oh, there you go. Uh, let's, let's do this. Good enough. Right. So, if I would say I want to take a buy, the second with a pending order, like here, right? I want to go in here, and my stop loss is this one. You can see that your take profits is going to be over here, with potential of over here, <clears throat> but. Looking at the angle that it took last time, that took 42 bars. In other words, 42 hours. So you're over yonder somewhere. So your take profit, or take profit number two, I should say, will be over here. Now, if we look at this line, that's also a smaller one hour resistance. So you go a little lower than that, and you grab this. Ratios are perfectly fine. Your outside resistance one and two. Let me change the type of line here. I know I'm doing this really quick and dirty, but bear with me. So we have this resistance, and you want to be a bit lower than that. So there. This is a perfectly good trade. That's six and a half thousand. That's sixteen thousand. So that's two point five ish. <clears throat> right? Risk reward ratio is okay. It's outside of the channel though, which means that you're gonna factor in this a little bit as your trailing stop. So that's 75,000 points. Points, not pips, points. Custom, so you would do a little bit less, 70,000 points. Boop. Now if this trade would activate, right, the second it hits here, if it doesn't break through, your stop loss would at least automatically have moved to zero here, securing your entry point. So at least you can't lose the trade anymore. Now I know some of you are gonna go, yeah, but trailing stops are not ideal. No, they're not, but I'm always realistic. For a lot of you, the problem is that you have your day jobs. You're not gonna be in front of the computer all day. You're not doing day trading for a living because then you can manually manipulate your trades and do micromanagement. For a lot of people, that's not the case. And I hear too many stories of people, yeah, I set up my stop loss and take profit and I came home and the trade went like 80% to more than my take profit and then it plunged down and I hit my stop loss. I guarantee myself <laughs> that a lot of people in the chat just went, yeah, that sounds familiar. Go on, hands up, let's be honest. Who's been in that scenario more than once? <laughs> see a whole bunch of hands up <laughs> yeah so this is why i always advise set up a trailing stop as well if you're doing it on crypto um you need to learn how to calculate the average daily range and pullback levels the average daily range or average candle range depending on the view you're looking at just measure the last 10 or 20 candles see how big they are and take the average of that and then take your trailing stop, that plus 20% or so. Right? That will put you in this level where if it pulls back, it should only pull back and hit the trailing stop if it does more than the average. Otherwise, you should be Gucci. And I know this means that sometimes you're going to come home and you see the trade went somewhere and you went out at zero or slightly plus. I know that that sucks. 
But in the end of the day, going out at zero means you lost time and not money. And if we're looking to create consistently profitable accounts, losing no money is more important than winning. Because we're only trying to control our downside. We're not trying to control our upside. Right. So with crypto, especially with the volatility in crypto, this is the most important part to make sure you have proper risk management or you will, and I will guarantee this, blow up your account in no time flat. You can see the big distances they travel. It is a lot of points that they cran. The smallest you can do is a mini lot, which is one cent per point or per pip, not per point. But you're talking about 14,000 points is literally nothing. It's a fart. So if you have a $500 account and you were looking at this, it's like, oh, I can start trading trading crypto. Eh, no. I hate to burst your bubble. Not your thing. You literally just don't have the balance for it. I think the lowest you should go, if you're really insisting on it, is like, when you start getting to a balance of about five thousand dollars in your account then you can start adding crypto as a cfd into your trading portfolio still risky because it's still quite a chunk but you need to keep in mind you want to oh yeah of course one you can always try on a demo right you can practice trading crypto on demo but the problem with demo is that when you trade on a demo, you you end up with building confidence and then you switch to live. And the first time you hit the ne negative, you're just going to kick yourself. It's like, oh, my God, I made all this money in crypto. And the first trade I do on live, I lose my money. I'm not going to do this again. Like it, it screws with your mentality in that sense. Like you need to just trading is about consistency over a prolonged period over time, not a moment. Right. So you have to stick to it. And if you don't have the balance to try it several times, um, you know, it, it's it's important to keep that in mind. Um, OK, now uh, people are starting to ask questions that are uh, not from the webinar. So we're going to go to the Q&A in a second. Um, but before everybody that jumps out, um, for those that are uh, staying with the Q&A, um, just hold on for one second. For those that are on YouTube, I would like to thank you all for watching and listening. And for those that are leaving the webinar now, thank you very much for coming. And I hope that you learned something and can apply this to your trades and get a little bit of a sense of what trading CFDs or trading crypto is like. And we hope to see you on the next webinar.